What's up, guys? Welcome to the Ace It Podcast. My name is Bauer Brown, co-founder, lead instructor of Ace Interdiction Tactics, one of law enforcement's fastest growing training companies in the nation, specializing in bringing our cops some of the best proactive training. If you have not checked out any of our classes, go to aceinterdiction.com, look at the list of classes that we have coming up, get registered, and make yourself better. All right, guys, welcome to the Ace It Podcast episode. God, what are we at? Six? I don't even remember. I don't now. remember. But the good thing is, is we have one of our instructors that are going to jump on with us, Jared Robinson here as one of our guests. I'm Bauer Brown, co-founder with Al Clark of Ace Interdiction Tactics, law enforcement's fastest training, growing training company, probably in the United States at this point. So we are happy to start up this podcast again and bring Jared on as uh, one of our guests. Jared has been instructing with us since the beginning of Ace It and adds that nice little touch of a prosecutor's point of view when it comes to our classes, when it comes to uh, the case law and reviewing it, make sure it's up to par and a uh, good standard with uh, U.S. Supreme Court state law as well as state case law. So we're happy to have him. Jared, if you want to just jump in, introduce yourself and let us know who you are. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Jared Robinson. I've been a prosecuting attorney since I started my career. Um, tried and true, blue, prosecuting, not going anywhere, not ever switching to the dark side. It's in my blood. Um, I've been doing it for 10 years now. Um, I have primarily prosecuted the major drug crimes for the, the entirety of my career. Um, but I've had to, you know, prosecuting in rural counties, I've had to take on a lot of different roles. And, you know, I've done a lot of DUI trials and justice court stuff. And I've had to take on some pretty major cases, including um, a drive by shooting on the I 40. Um, but if I'm being honest, my heart is in the drug prosecution and handling the major drug crime. So I've, I've done that for the majority of my career. I work closely with Navajo County's drug task force, MCAT. Um, but I handle all the major drug crimes for the Southern part of the County. Uh, so that includes, so this is Navajo County includes Sholo, uh, Heber, Pine Top Lakeside, Snowflake, um, and there, it's a target-rich environment, so there's lots of job security. Uh, we could probably handle having another prosecutor doing the major drug crimes in our county, but we have two. We break it up, North County and South County. Um, I got my start in prosecution uh, mainly because in law school, the classes that I was really good at were criminal law, criminal procedure, evidence, constitutional law. Um, pretty early on, pro uh, professors were telling me, like, hey, you seem to be fit either for defense work or for prosecution. Um, but then my background is my, my dad is in law enforcement. Um, he retired from the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office and, and now he works for Apache County. Um, but he, I grew up going to the shooting range with him, going on ride alongs with him. He worked a lot of lakes, did a lot of search and rescue. Um, so I grew up just being around cops and, um, my dad being who he is, I had a healthy respect for law enforcement. So I, I think I naturally gravitated towards the law enforcement side of things. Um, kind of a key marker of my career is that I've worked well with law enforcement. Um, I take pride in, in that relationship that I have and being able to communicate with them about all manner of things, but most importantly, um, getting cases ready for trial, suppression hearings, um, but having an open, honest relationship with my officers so that I can tell them when they've made mistakes as well. Um, and I've had a lot of success, uh, because I've been able to foster those relationships. You know, we, we often talk about this. We teach all over the nation. And one of the biggest complaints that we get from officers is that relationship between prosecutor or prosecuting office, district attorney's office, whatever it may be to, to the police agencies. And there's just like this. I don't know how to explain like a division it. A, between a, them. a division. Yeah. And I have noticed that when there is that division, um, it makes everybody's jobs harder, not just law enforcement, but it would make your job harder um, as well. And it's frustrating. The best thing that we've ever done is invite prosecutors to come to our class. Uh, we just recently taught a class here in Arizona and had a prosecutor come to it. And we watched a relationship build between that prosecutor and the people that were in his class because they could ask him questions while we were instructing 
and say, hey, like, this is what we're being taught. Do you agree with this? And the prosecutor says, yes, absolutely, I agree with this. And I'll, I'll go to the wall fighting for you on this. And uh, we taught another class in Arizona. Same thing. Prosecutor showed up. And uh, the one of the best reviews that I think we could ever get was at the end of that, the prosecutor was riding along with the deputies on uh, I-10 and I-40 and was just like, hey, this is awesome. Like, we didn't realize that this is what you guys are being taught. And once you see that division go away and this nice relationship built between both uh, police officer and, and attorneys, it's like a, a a whole new game. And it everybody's on the same page makes life a lot easier. So I definitely could see that or understand that. Yeah. Absolutely. Early on in my career, I was critiqued for being too close or too friendly with law enforcement. Um, and the thought was that it would make my job more difficult that if I had to decline a case or dismiss a case because of my relationship, I wouldn't be able to do that. But uh, the opposite is actually true. And if any prosecutor listens to this podcast, I highly recommend that you foster a good relationship with your officers. So on the one hand, I get to see just how much work you all put into your cases. And what that does is it, it does cause me to pump the brakes a little bit before I declare a case a bad case or I'm willing to give up on a case because I've seen the man hours put into it. I've seen the effort. I've seen the desire. I know that your hearts are in getting the bad guy and not in you know, making some sort of procedural misstep or something like that. Um, and so it does give me pause before I, I decide, like, now we can't go forward on this case. And then on the other hand, if there is a problem, because my relationship is so good with the officers, I can call them up and talk to them on the phone and be like, hey, jackass, you messed this up. And they don't take offense to it. They don't, they don't get in their feelings about it. They understand. And they understand that, you know, if, if it's me saying it to them, then there really must be no way that we can salvage the case because I don't usually give up on cases. I will fight to the bitter end. I'll make the judge make the call if I have to. Um, and so if I come to them and I'm like, we got to short circuit this thing, they understand that there's good reason for it. And so having that relationship makes everyone's job easier. Like you said, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make it any more difficult to uh, dismiss a case or decline a case if I need to. Yep. Right. I have that question a lot. How can we get rid of the division? I think we get that question almost everywhere we go because we always talk about our relationship with uh, you when you worked here as a prosecutor for for us. And uh, they ask us, well, how can we get it that How can we get our relationship with our prosecutor better? And I really think that the first step is, well, you have to communicate. You have to, you have to go. Have you made any effort to talk to your prosecutor and explain your expectations and then also listen to what their expectations are? And uh, part of your expectations can be, hey, we just want to make sure that we're communicating through our cases. And, you know, it's hard for us. I think this is a big problem where we submit a case at least. And then we don't hear a thing. We don't know anything. And there's no communication and we're always freaking out. We're always trying to call, hey, where's this case at? Um, is it pled out? I mean, there's cases that I thought were still going that had pled out, you know, three years ago that I thought were oh. still in the court process. And so that communication uh, is key. But as an officer, you have to be the one to probably initiate it um, because the way I've seen it is these guys get cases, you, you know, we think we're busy, but you, we don't, officers don't realize how busy you guys are when it comes to the amount of cases that you guys get on a daily mm -hmm. basis. Mm -hmm. And so officers just need to reach out to their prosecutors and give them their expectations. Don't make them crazy, but you know, at least that you want to stay in contact and communicate a little bit better. And that's the start of it in my brain. I don't know thoughts on that. Yeah. I, and I think that uh, when you're able to make contact and work with them, instead of just getting a declination in the, in the, in an email or whatever, you know, a lot of officers are turning around and they're saying, wow, they didn't like my case. They don't have any idea how much time I put into it, or they have no under, no reason. They don't understand why it was declined. And yet if they would communicate a little bit, uh, it might've been something that could have been fixed uh, with a little bit of uh, yeah, uh, supplemental work, or um, we learn from our mistakes. We've all been there. We've all made our mistakes with our cases and done things early on in our careers that kind of sabotage the case. And it's like, we, that's how we learn though. I mean, sometimes yeah. that's going to happen. And sometimes, you know, the prosecutors don't realize, I don't think they, I don't think they realize our concern, how much work we put into it or how much it means to us. Yep. So there's no, there's no communication on either side. And so, you know, I know there's sometimes the officers in our classes will come to me and they'll be like, well, 
you know, we don't get along. They just don't understand. It's like, but you have to put forth a little bit of effort too. Right. You know, it takes, it takes two, but, yeah. but I think if the officers start to make that, uh, uh, relationship grow a little bit, try to be understanding because, uh, they are busy and they do have a lot of things. Uh, and some things, I mean, we've seen as of recent, we've seen some cases that we understand why, yeah. why they're kicked back. I mean, some, some work is not the best. Yeah. We have to be open-minded, I think, but. Yeah, mm -hmm. I totally agree. Jared, thoughts on that as far as, um. Uh you know, strengthening that relationship or getting rid of that division between officer and prosecutor's office that we see kind of throughout the nation. What do you think on your end? So I, I think communication is key. I don't know that every situation could be salvaged. So if, if we're starting from a, just a realistic jumping off point, sometimes the personality of the prosecutor and law enforcement, it's just not going to jive. It's not going to work, but there is sort of a professional minimum that I think can be maintained that will help the relationship. You know, Al talked a lot about communicating the, the uh, resolution of cases. Um, I, I will forget from time to time because, you know, Bauer, you mentioned we, we do get a lot of cases and, and there are several cases that will settle for what's basically my standard offer on a, on a major drug crime case for a first time offender, which is, you know, three and a half years prison, plead to an attempt. Um, and to me, that's no big deal. I don't really think about it too much. If they take the offer early on and we don't have to like fight over anything, then, you know, it's good. And most of the time I, I won't, I won't call the officer up and tell him how the case is resolved. I know we're going to send out like a disposition sheet, but sometimes I forget that that was, you know, the officer's first time ever having a case like that. And to hear that somebody was sentenced to three and a half years on a case that he got that just resulted from a traffic stop is like the most thrilling news in the world. <laughs> and for me, it, you know, it's just commonplace. And, and so I, I do forget from time to time, but um, I think that communication of communicating uh, the resolution or what ultimately happened with the case should always happen. I think um, declination shouldn't just be explained in a letter. In fact, I rarely think that any explanation should be given in a letter or an email. Um, one that creates a paper trail and if there wasn't an actual constitutional violation then the last thing you want from your prosecutor is like hey you violated this guy's constitutional rights that's why i'm declining the case so i think for the most part those should always say in the interest of justice the case was declined but then there should be follow-up prosecutors should call the officer up and explain this is why we went the way we did on this case there were these problems you know we didn't think we could get a conviction or you know, there was an actual procedural misstep. We had to short circuit the case. So I think at a minimum, those type of communication should happen. But it is very helpful to have officers that will call and, and show that desire to hear the resolution of the case as well. I never have a problem with an officer calling me up excitedly wanting to know what happened with the case. Um, or they happen to know or notice on the court calendar that day that, you know, somebody they had arrested was going to court and they want to know what happened. I love those conversations and, and I think those should happen on the regular. And honestly, that helps put certain cases on my radar even better than they were before, knowing that there's a, a proactive officer, not just proactive in enforcement, but proactive and, and interested in the outcome of the case, wanting to know what's going on. That helps me out a lot. Yes. Agreed. You know, I had a uh, high school friend of mine graduate law school not too long ago. And after he graduated, he came to me and he's, he's actually come on a couple ride alongs with me. But one of his main questions was this. He said, listen, I just graduated law school and the amount of information that I learned in law school pertaining to what you do specifically as a law enforcement officer, how on earth do you know all that information or do you know all that information? Because I just learned all this in law school and I found out what you as an officer are expected to know. Like, And he's kind of quizzing me do you know all this stuff? And I'm like, well, what are you talking about specifically? And he started getting into case law and talking specifically about search and seizure, ca seizure case law. Um, and do we know exactly what we can and cannot do? And I had to explain to him, yes, for the, mo for the most part. Um, there's a lot of times where officers do not get the full instruction, I think, on that in the academy or they don't, what's the, they don't, uh, Retain it, maybe. Yeah, retain yeah. it. Yeah, yep. exactly. Don't retain it. Uh, the academy is kind of a harsh learning environment for some, and uh, maybe some can't retain a lot of information. 
but it is so important that we know that case law and we understand it because every officer at some point in time have been in a certain some type of situation where they thought can i do this or can i not do this or what can i do can i search this car do i not search the car can i take it back to my office whatever it may be and there's a lot of uh on the job learning and i explained that to him i said yeah we get 18 weeks of that and then the rest is on, <laughs> on the job and yeah. so one of the things that i think happens with that prosecutor relationship as well is i think prosecutors expect us to know more than we actually do some <laughs> like mm-hmm. like uh they they expect us to know things and so what's nice about having that relationship with somebody like jared like a prosecutor is we can go to him with questions and see his point of view and say hey in this situation what can we do and how do we do this the best way so you know we don't run into issues in court well i, I know no prosecutor is supposed to admit this but i i think it's the same in reverse that officers expect <laughs> prosecutors to know more than than they actually do or more than one is even possible uh, is even capable of knowing uh, there's just so much there's so much case law touching so many different areas we could talk for hours and hours about interdiction case law and reasonable suspicion and what you need to do to an advance an investigation and that's just the drug side of things you know if we're talking about you know sexual assault victims and and those investigations and how those play out and dealing with victims and defense attorneys rights to interview those victims you know there's just so much so um i I think it's important for prosecutors to keep that in mind um and remember that they don't know everything when their officers are struggling with certain things and there needs to be kind of a mutual empathy there um but man if law school teaches you anything it teaches you the ability to look stuff up really quickly um and if i learned anything from law school it was to be a, a good researcher um i don't know that i actually learned the law in law school. Um, that's been a lot of on the job training too, but the ability to critically think and to research is, is something you definitely gain from law school. Yep. Al, you've been on the job since I was like negative seven years old. Tell us about your experience <laughs> with prosecutors as as you've kind of gone throughout your career. Because I mean, I'm, I'm 10 years on, Jared, you're around 10 years on, I think, as a mm-hmm. prosecutor close to. Yep. And uh, you're on, you know, 72 years or whatever. It's been. Can, you, uh, can you kind of explain like your process of going through? Like, wh- first of all, you, you started on a, uh, in a tribal police department. Right. And did that differ when you started moving cases more to the state side? It or, did. It, it's, uh, you it, know, and federal. You do a lot of federal work. So tell us it, how you do uh, Well, and, and back in the day, it depended on which jurisdiction had it as to how they wanted it. Um, back when the trooper two-step was something that was, that was being practiced. Uh, the feds didn't like it that way. The state did. Um, and so you had to kind of know what you're going to seize almost <laughs> as to how you were going to do it, gonna how you're going to perform your dance. <laughs> but anyway, um, no, it's, it's, and sometimes it's frustrating in my, in my experience, you'll, uh, you'll get at a prosecutor and you work with them and you build a rapport with them and you finally get on, on a level where you're working well and they understand you and, and you're communicating and you, you go into hearings and you feel like you're going to win and you're on, you know, you're just, you're just unbeatable. And then something happens and they're either, they either leave or they move or they change positions or something. And then you get, Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like in my career, for whatever reason with the drug, especially the interdiction work, we seem to get uh, new attorneys or newer attorneys right out of school or it, it appears that way. And so it seems like you're always, um, trying to teach them in a way and I don't mean to be offensive but I mean you're trying to teach them like what you do and why you do it and 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 get along and and build a rapport with them and uh and then again it seems like they kind of move to another position and they start taking other types of cases or whatever but I think this attorney thing you know it's 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 huge to have that relationship um it's it's you don't want to be the officer that has no relationship and submitting high profile cases and or um, cases that the need of attention and not have that ability to call them and ask them for their opinions or if they need more follow-up or if they, you know, if they like the way this was done or should I do it this way? I'm not one to call the attorneys for every move that we make in the field. Um, however, there are times when you need to run things and bounce it off, especially some of these high profile yeah, cases absolutely. we've had. Yeah. I think it's important to have that relationship and it's, it's not, it's, I hate to say it, but it's rare. 
in my opinion, it's rare to have what, what we had with Jared. Um, every now and then you get one or two that are like that. And then it seems like you run a, a spell where you don't have that close relationship. Yeah. And like Jared said earlier, some of it's, uh, I don't know, just a bumping of heads. Maybe personalities don't match, yeah. but, um, I wish it was, I wish it was more the other way because that one class we taught early on in Arizona, um, they couldn't mesh. And after the class and it got kind of, kind of ugly in class a couple of times, I thought they heated. were going to go to blows Yeah, a little and heated. then they, they, uh, yeah, it was a little bit heated. And then at the end though, they had come together and come to an agreement and realized that, Hey, we're all on the same team trying to do the same work. And, uh, and they, they had a very good working relationship from that point forward. It seemed like, and, and I've seen that in a, some of the other places we've gone and you hear the horror stories of no communication and, you know, they throw our cases out for no reason and blah, blah, blah. But I really believe that we have to try. We, we, we really, we just can't stop trying. We as officers have an obligation. If we're going to submit these cases to at least try and establish a relationship. Yeah, I agree. It comes up. I, I think I, I, do it. I think I share this story a, a lot at, at training, but it's the one that stands out to me. Um, one of my, it was actually my very first trial that I got to do when I started working for the Apache County attorney's office before I'd even done a misdemeanor bench trial or anything like that. We had that felony drug load, seven pounds. It was Al's case. Um, and I, I remember him seeing if he could meet with me and, and talk over the case. And I think he understood that um, I had been kind of thrown a, a rough situation, not having the trial experience and not having much time to prepare for trial. And Al's willingness to come in and talk to me and break it down and explain some things to me about interdiction that I had absolutely no knowledge of was pivotal in giving me the confidence to even do the trial. I, I think, I mean, there's there's no way to remove nerves from a trial. Um, the only thing that is remotely helpful is preparation. And I was certainly in the mode of of preparing and over preparing for that trial as best I could given the short time frame that we had. But Al's confidence was enough that it sort of transferred over to me and kind of gave me at least the thought, maybe it was just arrogance, but I was like, I can do this. I can get this conviction. I, I We got a good case here. And that was largely because of Al's confidence in the work product that he produced. Um, and, and without him coming in and chatting with me, I, I, you know, I don't know if I muster the confidence to put on that trial like I did, like I should have been able to do. Um, and so that relationship is extremely important and it becomes extremely powerful if, if your goal is to put away these people that are transporting and trafficking and drugs. Absolutely. We've said it over and over. We keep using the word like team and that's exactly what it is. And we have to start looking at it that way on both sides. Cops yeah. have to start looking at it. Prosecutors have to start looking at it that way. And, you know, if cops, if you're frustrated with the way your prosecutor is, you know, playing things out or, um, you know, low balling uh, offers or whatever it may be, then go and talk with them. Prosecutors, if you're frustrated with cops, and the way their investigations are, you have to go talk with them and ex explain to them, hey, this is what I need. I don't want you know what you've been doing. I want you to do a little bit extra. And I did see that recently with uh, our situation where um, our prosecutor's office actually had a meeting with us um, over some high profile cases uh, through our whole department and basically said, hey, when we're investigating these cases, this is what we want from you guys. And there were things that they told us that we should be doing that a lot of our officers at that time were like not even thinking about doing that, but that's their expectation. So them coming to us and telling us what they wanted from our investigations made us do what they wanted. And they, our relationship completely turned around at that point and, you know, made it a better working relationship. So it goes both ways. And I think what Jared said is so important. Um, I think it's so much better to go have that talk face to face versus an email yeah. or, you know, messaging because, you need to hear the tone of the voice and really get the feel for the conversation yeah, um, because you can feed off of things that are different. Uh, you can take it the wrong way. Um, I don't think that's the way to address it. I think you go face to face if you can at all Agreed. and get that conversation done. I totally agree with that. 
Well, Jared, let's uh, let's hear from you as far as as a prosecutor, and you prosecute a lot of drug cases. A lot of our audience are drug cops. What are some things that you look for in a drug investigation, particularly that that you like us to see, or you like to see, um, or things that you don't want to see? Anything like that? So, um, I don't. All right, I. I I'll start with the things that I like to see, I guess. I, I like to see an officer who will lay out everything that he noticed, articulate everything that he noticed, whatever whatever triggered the spidey senses initially. If we're, if we're talking about traffic stops specifically, um, you know, the, the way that they change lanes, the way that they, you know, appeared stiff and rigid as they passed by or the, weir- the way that they started smoking a cigarette, rolled down their window. Um, I, I like... I like to hear everything from the beginning from reaction to presence to their driving behavior. Once they realize they're getting stopped, um, how they're driving immediately after noticing the officer Uh, detail, every little bit of detail you can give me makes it even better. Um, We've talked about reasonable suspicion being this mosaic that an officer is painting where they're taking lots of little pieces of things and putting them together. Um, and the courts even reference reasonable suspicion as a mosaic. Um, and, and I like that terminology because you are, you're crafting kind of this masterpiece uh, carved out of little details that to somebody who doesn't know that world might not be meaningful at all. Uh, but to you as an officer with your experience, all of those little details add up. And so the more details you can give me, regarding your reasonable suspicion, the better off that we're going to be, especially if it goes to a suppression hearing later on. So I really like to see that. And I don't think, I don't engage anymore in the habit of like uh, talking about certain details as if they're kind of silly or meaningless. Um, I think that's natural for every prosecutor, every judge, every defense attorney to do when they're analyzing reasonable suspicion. Um there's some things that'll be included in a report where you're like, Hmm, I don't see how that could ever be a thing. (laughs) Um, but you know, you, you talk to your officers and you ask them about it and there, there are reasons why those things were included. Um, and then I've been impressed reading all the case law and reasonable suspicion, just how many things stood out to, you know, either the Arizona Supreme court justices or the actual U S Supreme court justices that contributed towards their, um, analysis of reasonable suspicion. And a lot of times there are things that I have thought in the past weren't very significant, like I mentioned this already, but the, the stiff and upright posture, um, that's something that's listed in our visu as a factor contributing to reasonable suspicion. So I, I like as much detail as possible. Every little thing matters. Yeah. If I can comment really quick on that, Jared, because we, we recently just had this happen where, uh, we had some questions regarding a report um that was sent to us and 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 not to i'm not talking bad about this officer one bit or whatsoever but what i've seen in the past or what this officer was doing was exactly what i was doing when i first started and what it was was this we would list what made us suspicious right so we would like you were talking about the lived in look um but let's let's uh go through some others let's say you know air fresheners in a rental or Um, you know, some of these things that we used to really rely on heavily back in the day. Um, and now we've changed more to interview techniques to where we can, you know, cover more of their story and get out their cover story, stuff like that. But what happens is people list everything that is suspicious to them. Now, the problem here is, is that this is the officer's point of view and you're the one that has the training and experience who doesn't have the training and experience that you do are the prosecutors, the defense attorneys, the judges, and the jury. So what often people forget or police officers forget when they're writing an interdiction report is they will list all these things, but they forget what we call the bridge. The bridge is what connects everything that you listed over to criminal activity when considered in their totality. And so you listed all these things, but the bridge wasn't there. So you're saying you're suspicious on all of these things, but in your report or even face-to-face to your prosecutor, you never articulated why this combined with everything else made you suspicious. And we call it the bridge. And so this officer had sent me his report and I said, Hey, 
I can see where you're trying to go. But the reason the AUSA doesn't like this is because there's there's no bridge. We yeah. need you to articulate why this made you suspicious. And so you got to break everything down. I mean, there was a point in time where I used to write my reports where I'd basically just list them one through 30 and say, you know, air freshener in a rental, nervousness, story didn't make sense, inconsistent stories. And I'd go on and on just listing the bare minimum and then saying I was suspicious because of those. And just like you said, as a prosecutor, you're looking at these like, what? How yeah. is that? How is that suspicious at all? Like that doesn't even, that doesn't make sense. But when an officer with training and experience can actually articulate in the totality of these, this list on why it's suspicious, then you've created that bridge. And so we just have to remember to create that bridge. So our prosecutors aren't looking at our cases like, what is this? <laughs> in the interest of justice, <laughs> right. we're not prosecuting this. And and one great technique to make that bridge, I think, is to make some sort of comparative analysis between the traffic stop that you're writing about and other traffic stops that you've done. Absolutely, yep. Because um, in, in truth, everything that leads to reasonable suspicion, if you take it one by one, it could be innocent conduct. It's never criminal conduct. If it was just outright criminal conduct, then we're talking about probable cause. We're not talking about reasonable suspicion anymore. So every factor that contributes to reasonable suspicion, if taken in isolation, will be innocent in nature. So it's up to the officer then to uh, pinpoint and explain why that behavior uh, fits into the whole of the encounter and why that led to the officer's suspiciousness. So like one great way, and, and this will go into something I hate to see in reports, uh, if an officer points out how nervous somebody is on a traffic stop, but they don't tell me this person was way more nervous than the three other traffic stops I conducted earlier that day, or this person was way more nervous than the hundreds of traffic stops I've done in my career, or their nervousness didn't subside even after I told them they were getting a warning. If, the, if they don't compare that nervousness to something, the nervousness alone, just it's not going to get it done. It, it's not enough. Now, if you combine that with a bunch of other things, then, then sure. But um, a lot of officers will rely on nervousness as kind of a crutch. And it, it is of little value unless it's compared to something else. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. No, you're right, Jared. When it comes to nervousness, that was often something that I fell back on as a young interdictor too was – uh, and I've talked about this so much, so I'll, I'll make it quick, but I was always looking for that nervousness. And if it wasn't thick, I'd cut him loose and I would go back to Alan and just say, Hey, you know what? He wasn't nervous or anything. So I let him go. And it wasn't until, you know, I started, I don't know, I was probably four or five years into interdiction where I realized like, Oh my gosh, I'm arresting a lot of people that were not showing nervousness for one. Mm -hmm. So there's, it goes both ways. Could be, the reason people don't show nervous is because they're experienced. The analogy that I always use is, you have the 20-year cop who's been going to the domestic violence shot fired call his whole career. He's seen some stuff. His blood pressure is not going to be as high. He's not going to be as nervous as the rookie that comes through when he's going to that same call. Same with drug smugglers. They might not always be nervous. We've seen very experienced, high-level drug smugglers show no nervousness. However, we have seen uh, drug smugglers they on scene uh, <laughs> <laughs> completely freak out. I mean, can't even put a full sentence together when they're loaded. So you kind of have this wide range there. Um, so there's a couple of reasons why we don't solely rely on nervousness, uh, that being one of them. And then also there's there's a lot of other things that we need to be looking for other than that. And Jared, I like what you said when it come when you, when you're talking about comparing it to the other traffic stops because everybody is nervous when they get pulled over. I mean, I got pulled over by DPS not too long ago and I was terrified right now granted it was dps so i thought i was getting a yeah, ticket. yeah you knew you were getting a ticket for sure <laughs> yeah. so i was absolutely terrified and he walked up to the car window and uh ultimately my wife i don't like to tell other officers that i'm a cop on traffic stops it feels i don't know it just feels dirty like i'm trying to get out of a ticket but my wife has no shame so she was like <laughs> oh yeah he's a he's a canine officer with the uh, apache county sheriff's office he's late for canine training so that's why we're going so fast <laughs> and uh so ultimately uh he he uh, he still chastised me. He still gave me the, the, the trooper, uh, lecture and basically told me he was going to go and, and write me a warning. Well, just like you had said, once I received the outcome of the stop that I was getting a warning, by the time he reapproached and issued me an actual warning, 
um, my nervousness has had completely subsided. So yeah, I'd seen that personally in my life where um, if you're on a traffic stop and once you've given the outcome of the stop, such as a warning, and you start to get into your roadside conversation and start asking questions about travel plans and you see that uptick in nervousness and no longer is it starting to, or you don't see it subsiding, you just see it going off the charts, then yes. And compare that to other people that you have stopped. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad you brought that up, Jerry. That's a good point. Yeah, I think that's a great way to to make that bridge. Um, Absolutely. And, and that's just, you know, we're, we're talking about nervousness as a factor. That's just one of the the many things that you can talk about and create a bridge there. Um, yes. But I, I do think a comparative analysis as to nervousness is helpful. So I, I, I really don't like to see just a, a mention of general nervousness, especially as it pertains to the beginning of the traffic stop. That's a great tip. I think anybody who's listening should definitely jot that down and remember that because Absolutely. I've run into it. You know, I tell a story in class, but you know, I remember li- relying so much on nervousness. I'm in federal court and I was talking about, uh, or in my report, the only thing I listed as extreme nervousness or sign of was uh, the driver's hands were shaking as he retrieved his license from his wallet. And that was it. Um, and I remember in federal court them asking me um, something along the lines of, would it surprise you if we could show you as well as the court that Mr. Bannon was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease? Mm. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, all right, you got me on that one. Let's just keep moving. <laughs> um, so that actually sparked us to when we start teaching our classes, we've moved into this thing we call the cluster rule when it comes to nervousness. And the cluster rule is basically taking everything that you observe during your traffic stop, every, if you're, let me put it this way. If you're going to articulate extreme nervousness, we basically have a list of nervous cues. And if I only hit one or maybe two nervousness actually doesn't even make it into my report. Mm. But when I'm hitting seven or eight of these cues that we look for, I know based on my training and experience that that is now extreme based on everybody that I have stopped in my career they're showing one to two, three of these signs of nervousness. But based on my experience with intercepting drug smugglers, when they're hitting seven or eight, there's definitely something else going on here, whether that is drug smuggling, human trafficking, sex trafficking, child pornography, IEDs in the trunk, whatever right. it could be, there's something else going on there um, compared with obviously some of the other factors. But I've noticed yeah. that. So we start teaching a cluster rule is what we talk. Yeah, you're looking for um, nervousness that either extends the duration of the stop or it's so present and pervasive during the stop that it just can't can't be ignored. Like you can't overlook it while you're interacting with the person. Yep. Um, I think that brand of nervousness is more akin to criminal nervousness if there is such a thing. I think too, in in over-reliance on nervousness, and I want to say, Bauer, you're the one that told this story about a young man like 19 or something being so nervous on a traffic stop and you were just certain there was something there and all they had was like a joint in their ashtray um and they just thought that that was like the end of the world for them and that's why they were so nervous but they they didn't have anything else yeah um and so that over reliance on nervousness can can lead you to um busts that are like that and and like you said it's it's the professionals that you really want to go after the ones that have done it enough that they're not showing all those signs of extreme nervousness, but they got the other things going on, the wonky stories and the weird driving behavior and the, you know, yep. Whatever else you look at. Absolutely. Yeah. We just compare it to the innocent motoring public who we stop on a daily basis and we go by that cluster when it comes to nervousness. And then even when we just have that, you know, it's, it's just not enough for us to move forward as far as uh, we want to compare it to the other factors that we talk about in our two-day class. That, you know, yeah. we throw it in there with that and combine it into the totality review, um, which brings me to uh, my next case that I wanted to discuss quickly. And I want you to comment on this, Jared, as well as you, Al, since you've been in this game for a long time. But one of my favorite cases that we discuss in class, which is United States VR Vizu. And the reason that I want to talk about it is because oftentimes when you're an officer getting into interdiction, one of the things that you will struggle with is your confidence in reasonable suspicion and do I have it or do I not have it? And I don't know, Al, in your, you know, 30 something years of being a police officer, um, is that something that you found yourself struggling with earlier on? And then as you gained experience, it was like, okay, I'm here. Like I'm at reasonable suspicion. 
Absolutely. I think it's, uh, I think, I, I think it goes back to, I think you're taught early on, but I think it's such a fire hose effect that you don't yeah. retain it. And, and I don't think you, I really think you need to experience it. Exactly. And in, in, a, in a case before you really truly start to understand, and it takes a little bit, but yeah, I think, um, you know, reasonable suspicion is something that if you're not confident in, yes, I'm there and you don't understand like what it takes and what it is and where it's at, um, people struggle with this. I see it all the time. People struggle with whether they're there or not. Yep. Um, you hear stories, horror stories of, you know, oh, I had a good one last night, you know, <laughs> yeah. but I let it go because I didn't have enough or, yep. you know, and, and people don't really understand what level we're talking or how to obtain it. And I think it's one of the most misunderstood topics there are out there. I really do. And probably one of the most important as a police officer. Yes. Because uh, there's a, I, I've talked about it on the podcast before, but there's a YouTube video out there where a, a lady basically stops a guy on the side of the road due to report of having a weapon, quickly finds out that it's not a weapon. And basically at that point has just, I mean, at first didn't even have enough to detain him, mm -hmm. but detains him and is requiring ID from him. And that is it. Like, I mean, it is so quick mm -hmm. and doesn't provide his ID ID. And the next thing you know, he's thrown in a police car and arrested. And that guy got a healthy amount of money right. due to that lawsuit because of not understanding what reasonable suspicion is. But I think we could go as far as to say and comment on this, Jared, before we jump into our visu, but what you said was interesting. And we could probably go as far to say is you have to have experience to get reasonable suspicion. I think it's not for me, I'll, I'll speak for me only, but just to read about it or have somebody tell you about it in a classroom setting is very difficult for me to understand. Now, when I can go out and have a tangible uh, experience with yeah. that and then walk through it and be like, okay, all of these things, um, to me, that's how I learn. And I think we miss that yeah. early on in our careers. I think there's, uh, we have 18 weeks of an academy and I'm sure you're taught at some point, yeah. but it's a very stressful environment. And then you have an FTO program, um, depending on your program, you may or may not clarify things mm -hmm. about it. And, um, you know, so many times officers, uh, young officers, I believe, are doing things because they've been taught they can, but I don't think they really understand why they why. can do it. Yeah. And that goes back into case laws and it goes into to all of this. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason why we say, you know, based on my training and experience, because I don't know, Jared, as a prosecutor, um, I think it helps you out more and comment on this, but you get an officer who's, let's say, you know, been in the task force for 10 plus years, he's got the experience you have an officer that's right out of the academy making these traffic stops trying to testify to experience is a little bit hard, I would assume, to to do your job on your end. Well, the, the experience piece uh, not only provides proper foundation for the things that you'll talk about um, being meaningful to you on a traffic stop. You know, if you've conducted thousands of traffic stops and you're trying to say that a behavior was weird during that specific traffic encounter, then that's going to give whatever it was you're talking about a lot of weight. So there's a foundational element and then there's a credibility element, um, both of which you obtain by having good training and experience. I think probably experience outweighing the trainings that you go to as well. But I think that shouldn't cause newer officers to shy away from trying to get into this game. Because um, how much time do you need to gain sufficient experience to understand kind of what baseline normal is mm -hmm. you know it, it requires some minimal proactivity making traffic stops understanding how the innocent motoring public responds to your traffic stops um, before you can then begin to engage in those comparative analysis from one stop to the next um, and so certainly and the case law bears it out the more experience an officer has the more weight and deference that will be given to the things that the officer says were meaningful. However, um, a new officer can still, uh, provided they can articulate what they were noticing and why it stood out to them, um, they can still form all the foundational things they need to get to reasonable suspicion. Right. Right. Yep. I do like that. Well, that being said, I'm going to uh, switch my screen over really quick and I'm just going to go over one of my favorite uh, case laws, which is our visa. Now, let me explain a little bit on why this is my favorite really quick. And it may not be 
the reason people think, but one of the reasons I love it is because once again, we have a case that is rebuking the Ninth Circuit Court for their terrible analysis of reasonable suspicion. <laughs> so I absolutely love it for that reason. Uh, being in the Ninth Circuit Court, it's frustrating sometimes. And it's funny to see that the U.S. Supreme Court has actually numerous times tried to tell them, hey, stop doing this. So really quick. And, and you uh, got to go you got to understand, too, about this, that like the U.S. Supreme Court isn't going to come out and unprofessionally say the Ninth <laughs> Circuit is stupid and they're off their rocker, right? They're going to they're going to word it in as professional a manner as they possibly can, but the fact that this verbiage shows up in an official opinion that was <laughs> written by a Supreme Court justice is tantamount to a nasty tongue lashing. This is this is an adult speaking to a child. Like that's <laughs> that is the equivalent to this opinion and and so you're right. Th this is amazing stuff. Um this Arvizu case is like you said it, it's one of my favorite as well. Yeah, so let's jump in really quick to the facts of the case for our listeners so they just understand if they're not familiar with Arvizu. And here's how you can use it. So what you're going to find here in the facts of the case is, is basically, you know, they're gonna, we're going to dive into a little bit about the reasonable suspicion to conduct a traffic stop. But I don't necessarily want you guys to be thinking of it that way. I just want you to understand that he's going to, you know, basically articulate his reasonable suspicion to stop this car. But I want you to understand that you can use this when you're doing your roadside conversation, not necessarily for a traffic stop, but it's going to show you that the U.S. Supreme Court is not outlining this huge or outlining this huge burden for reasonable suspicion. Because basically, what they look at when it comes to uh, Agent Stoddard is like, yeah, yeah, we're totally good here. So here's come a couple of the facts of the case: U.S. Border Patrol Agent <clears throat> Stoddard was working a checkpoint at U.S. Highway 191 north Douglas north of Douglas, Arizona. Uh, this is in 1998. In this area, the roads are equipped with sensors to alert agents to the presence of traffic on infrequently traveled roads, a sign that smugglers of drugs or aliens might be in the area. At 2.15 p.m., a car passing on a nearby road tripped a sensor and Stoddard went to investigate. Agents typically change shifts around this time. Stoddard found the vehicle that tripped the sensor. It was a minivan, that's, uh, the sort of car that smugglers used to transport their cargo. As it approached Stoddard, it slowed dramatically from about 55 miles per hour to about 30. An adult man was driving, his posture was rigid, and he conspic conspicuously ignored Stoddard as Stoddard passed by. Stoddard found this behavior suspicious because most drivers in the area wave at passing in the area wave at passing motorists. Stoddard also noticed children sitting in the back seat of the minivan. Their knees were propped up high as if their feet were resting on something on the floor. At this point, Stoddard pulled alongside the car. The children in the back seat started to wave at Stoddard in a peculiar, peculiar, I'm sorry, manner. As Stoddard was driving alongside the car, the driver abruptly signaled a turn onto the last available road that would avoid the checkpoint. Stoddard radioed for a registration check on the minivan and found out that there that it was registered to an address in Douglas, known for heavy narcotic trafficking. At this point, Stoddard stopped the minivan. Stoddard learned that the driver's name was Ralph Arvizu. Arvizu. Stoddard asked Arvizu for permission to search the van and found almost 129 pounds of marijuana. Obviously, that's just the, the facts that we get right here, but I'm sure there's a little bit more involved in that. But ultimately, what happens here, Arvizu is charged and uh, it goes through the court system and, uh, and basically at some point, it goes to a suppression hearing. It's not suppressed. Then it goes up to the Ninth Circuit Court, and the Ninth Circuit basically looks at everything that Stoddard listed one by one, and as we were talking about earlier, drew this conclusion that you know if you take one of these things by themselves, it's not criminal. And as as Jared said, well, yeah, if it was criminal, then they would be arrested for it. Like we're not saying they're criminal; we're saying in the totality, it reached reasonable suspicion. And so the Ninth Circuit basically does this analysis breaking down all of his reasonable suspicion one point by one point saying that this is innocent behavior and ultimately throws the case out. The government then appeals to the Supreme Court, which I'm so glad they did because then we got the court's ruling. So it, the court's ruling uh, summarizes here. It says the court reiterated that when reviewing courts make reasonable suspicion determinations, they must look at the totality of the circumstances to see if the officer had particularized objective and objective basis for suspecting a person of committing a crime. According to the court, 
the approach taken by the Ninth Circuit, in which it found that seven of Stoddard's ten reasons were susceptible of an innocent explanation, did not examine the totality of the circumstances and thus ran counter to the de novo review that the court had previously ruled should apply to the appellate review of reasonable suspicion determinations. For our visu to slow down stiffness posture and avoid making eye contact with suspicious in an area like southeastern Arizona, where most drivers are courteous and polite to other drivers. Furthermore, the children had obviously been coached to wave at Stoddard as he was driving. Taken together, these factors suggest that Stoddard reasonably suspected Arvizu was engaged in criminal activity. So what's crazy about this entire thing is that when you come to our two-day class, we are going to give you so much more to look at, to analyze to reach a reasonable suspicion. I mean, these are not a whole lot. And the U.S. Supreme Court is saying, yeah, we're good with it. You know, by the time you're done with our two-day class, you're going to have a lot more to articulate in cases like this. Um, what, I, what I loved in this case yeah. <laughs> was um, that the officer, Agent Stoddard, stopped this vehicle under suspicion that they were involved in drug trafficking or human trafficking. He hadn't witnessed an actual violation and all of his reasonable suspicion was formed from pre-stop indicators, his knowledge of the area, the customs, um, and this, this person's behavior, the fact that he's driving a passenger vehicle on these roadways. Um, he kind of pieces this all together on the fly and the courts were like, yeah, that's that's good enough for a traffic stop. I think officers rely too often on a need to have some sort of violation to conduct a traffic stop. Um, and while I do think that is wise in most instances, and I think you can come up with a couple different reasons to stop a vehicle, um, you don't need it. If, if there is a lot going on there, if their driving behavior is such or they're really in a weird area, they're acting strange, and you can put it all together and articulate it, then the standard you need to conduct a traffic stop is reasonable suspicion. If you actually witness a violation, that's more akin to probable cause than it is to reasonable suspicion. So actually witnessing a traffic violation far exceeds the requirement that you need to fulfill to conduct a traffic stop. True. Yep, absolutely. And we talk about that uh, quite extensively as well in our two-day class. Uh, you know, oftentimes we're not in an area like Stoddard is where, you know, he's tripping sensors, middle of shift change, you know, down at the border and we're just driving across I-40. So sometimes we don't get that type of behavior. And if you're not getting that type of behavior, such as what Stoddard witnessed, then yeah, we're going to do like what Jared was talking about is hopefully we're going to observe a violation and get probable cause to stop the car. And we always recommend trying to get two to three violations when stopping a car because we know the first thing that defense attorneys are going to target trying to get rid of evidence is going to be that traffic stop. So do your best to make sure that those are legit and you can get as many as you can for sure. I love the language that the court uses here. They say, um, and, and I encourage everyone to read the Arvizu case, but we have said repeatedly that a reviewing court must look at the totality of the circumstances. That's just like, how many times do I have to tell you? We have yeah. said repeatedly. <laughs> um, and then they said, we have deliberately avoided reducing reasonable suspicion to a neat set of legal rules. So, you know, this analysis and part of the reason why the, the Court of Appeals rejected the trial court's analysis was because they said that it introduced a troubling degree of uncertainty into the reasonable suspicion analysis. They wanted some sort of framework from the court where they could get it right every single time no matter the circumstances. And the U.S. Supreme Court was like, no, it doesn't work that way. It's very individualized to every case. We can't just give you like a silver bullet method for determining reasonable suspicion. And we're sorry you don't like the troubling degree of uncertainty that exists in these analysis, but, you know, tough. You got to deal with that. That's the law. <laughs> um, they said, we think the approach taken by the Court of Appeals here departs sharply from the teachings of prior cases. So, you know, they're, they're way out in left field on this one. They've just, they've gone off on their own tangent. Um, anyways, there's a lot more language like that, which um, essentially amounts to a tongue lashing from the Supreme Court. <laughs> which I, I absolutely love. So I was, uh, so we put a, a segment into our class 
about USB Watson, which ultimately, if you guys are not familiar with Watson, it basically talks about how um, basically a guy was arrested for fraudulent credit cards. Um, he didn't have the credit cards on him. A sting operation was put together to get this guy. He didn't have the credit cards on him, but they had probable cause to arrest him. So they they arrest him and ultimately end up asking him while he's in custody if he can search the vehicle. And Watson says yes and grants him permission. Well, this goes all the way up to the Ninth Circuit Court once again, and the Ninth Circuit Court basically says, no, he can't give consent while he's in custody. And it, luckily, the government pushed it up and, and appeals it up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court, this is in 1976, by the way. And I think, when was uh, our visa? Was that 90? 98, didn't it? 98. I think that's what you said. 98. I think I said it. Yeah. Oh, wait. Let's see. I think this is in 2002. Oh, wait. No. The stop was in 98. Yeah. The ruling was in 2002, it looks like. Okay. So you have this in 2002, our visa, where the, Ninth, or the uh, U.S. Supreme Court is once again yelling at the Ninth Circuit. And this case in Watson, which is in 76, they say the same thing. If you look at it, they get pissed off at the Ninth Circuit Court because they didn't look at all of the circumstances involving his consent, talking about how he wasn't at the police station being completely interrogated. Um, he was still on scene. Um, they didn't threaten him in any way. And they basically outline a whole bunch of reasons on why his consent was still non-coercive and was his own. Even though he was in handcuffs, he could still give consent while in custody, which that goes even further into, um, based on the totality of the circumstances, suspects can give consent while they are detained. If they can give consent while they are in custody, they can give consent while they're detained. Right. Um, but there is a, Mm -hmm. is a totality that the court looks at in how that consent was uh, given, you know, coerced or threatened or any of that sort. So even in 1976, they're yelling at the Ninth Circuit Court, like, <laughs> can you please just look at the totality for once in your life? And in 2002, same thing. So it's interesting. And I yeah, love there's... the fact that we run into that as far as the U.S. Supreme Court finally mm -hmm. just standing up saying, okay, Ninth, you stop. There's a reason we refer to him as the Ninth Circus and... <laughs> Um, for whatever reason, they just want, they want these things spoon fed to them. They want a real easy analysis. One that's like, you, you know, like a three pronged approach. And if, you know, all the elements are met, then you have reasonable suspicion. Um, and it, it just doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way in real life. These, these analyses that happen on the fly dealing with real human beings, um, are always going to be messy on some level. That's just the nature of working with people. Um, it's not going to be predictable. You're not going to be able to guess the outcome from the start every time. You really got to go through every little detail to understand what's happening in any given case. Yep, I like that. It's not going to happen in real life. So many circumstances are different. I mean, I've written you know, quite a bit of interdiction reports and they're, they're not all the same, even though the defense attorney always wants to say that. You know, you just have a cookie cutter template that you plug all this stuff into. And that's completely wrong. That's not at all what we do. Um, but a lot of these uh, circumstances differ and a lot of things that I'll look at, some things I'll see on one stop that made me completely suspicious. I don't see that on the other stop. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so there isn't a cookie cutter approach to reasonable suspicion at all. And if we yeah. were to determine or the court was to determine something like that, that would be terrible. It'd be detrimental. Yeah, it would suck wouldn't be a useful tool at all right because that's yeah. just that's not how it is to work with human beings it th there's no way that you can make it conform to a certain framework yep yep by the way word of the day i <laughs> i was reading the ornelas case and the court said that they were rejecting a procrustean um model for determining reasonable suspicion or probable cause Procrustean. And of course, I didn't know what procrustean meant. I, if somebody out there like already knows right away what that means, then like kudos to you because I read a lot of stuff and I had never seen that word before. <laughs> um, but procrustean means enforcing uniformity or conformity without regard to natural variation or individuality. Interesting. Wow. So they they recognized in working with human beings that. You, you're going to have this sort of natural deviation from some sort of normal standard. You, you just can't, you can't make a cookie cutter model. It doesn't work that way. Mm. Wow. Yep. That's good. And, and again, that's, 
you know, interdiction as a whole is, is fluid. It's different. It's not standardized, right? So you have DUIs, you have, it's very standardized. You're going to have exactly what you're looking for. This cue, this cue, this cue, this cue, this cue. Right. And Mm -hmm. uh, interdiction is not that way. Mm -hmm. It depends on your area. Just like, you know, agent Stoddard, he's working the border. That area in which he was working weighed into his reasonable suspicion. The area alone uh, worked into that. So it's going to be a little bit different um, throughout where you're working, your experience, your training. It's fluid. It's, it's you know, not standardized like a DUI. Yeah. Hey, speaking of Ornelis, you want to kind of jump in and explain a little bit about it? Yeah, I'd love to start off by sharing the facts of the case because um, I think these facts are pretty cool and um, are pretty helpful in, in kind of understanding what the court was dealing with. Um so let me get to my spot here. They say the facts are not disputed. Um, and before I read further, Bauer, you touched on this a little bit, but the facts that we have to go off of when we read an opinion are only included in the opinion because they stood out to the Supreme Court justice offering the opinion. Um, and so when you're reading over these facts or the list of things that contribute to reasonable suspicion, they are only there because they had import to a sitting U.S. Supreme Court justice. So I think that's important, and I think that's another great reason why officers should read case law, because it kind of helps you zero in on the things that have mattered to very high-ranking judges. Okay. Um, but they say the facts are not disputed. In the early morning of a December day in 1992, Detective Michael Pouts, a 20-year veteran of the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Department, with two years specializing in drug enforcement, was conducting drug interdiction surveillance in downtown Milwaukee. Um, Pouts noticed a 1981 two-door Oldsmobile with California license plate in a motel parking lot. The car attracted Pouts' attention for two reasons, because older model two-door General Motor cars are a favorite with drug couriers, because it is easy to hide things in them, and because California is a source state for drugs. Detective Pouts radioed his dispatcher to inquire about the car's registration. The dispatcher informed Pouts that the owner was either Miguel Ledesma Ornelas or Miguel Ornelas Ledesma from San Jose, California. Pouts was unsure which name the dispatcher gave. Detective Pouts checked the motel registry and learned that an Ismael Ornelas, accompanied by a second man, had registered at 4 a.m. without reservations. Pouts called his partner, Donald Pearl, a detective with approximately 25 years of law enforcement experience assigned for the past six years to the drug enforcement unit. When Hurl arrived on the scene, the officers contacted the local office of the Drug Enforcement Administration and asked DEA personnel to run the names Miguel Ledesma Ornelas and Ismail Ornelas through the Narcotics and Dangerous Drug Information System, also known as NADIS. Um, By the way, do you guys use that system? Have you ever used NADIS? Natus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Natus? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a federal database of known and suspected drug traffickers. Both names appeared in Natus. The Natus report identified Miguel Ledesma Ornelas as a heroin dealer from El Centro, California, and Ismail Ornelas Jr. as a co- cocaine dealer from Tucson, Arizona. The officers then summoned Deputy Ludka and the department's drug sniffing dog, Merlin which, by the way, might be the coolest canine name I've ever heard of. Merlin? Um, Yeah, so if if you're looking for a name for your dog in the future, Merlin's (laughs) pretty sweet. Um, Upon their arrival, Detective Pouts left for another assignment. Detective Hurl informed Lutka of what they knew, and together they waited. Sometime later, petitioners emerged from the motel, and got into the Oldsmobile, Detective Hurl approached the car, identified himself as a police officer, and inquired whether they had any illegal drugs or contraband. Petitioners answered no. Hurl then asked for identification and was given two California driver's licenses bearing the names Saul Ornelas and Ismail Ornelas. Hurl asked if he could search the car and petitioners consented. The men appeared calm, but Ismail was shaking somewhat. Deputy Ludka, who over the past nine years had searched approximately 2,000 cars for narcotics, searched the Oldsmobile's interior. He noticed that a panel above the right rear passenger armrest felt somewhat loose 
and suspected that the panel might have been removed and contraband hidden inside. Lutka would testify later that a screw in the door jam adjacent to the loose panel was rusty, which to him meant that the screw had been removed at some time. Lutka dismantled the panel and discovered two kilograms of cocaine and the petitioners were arrested. So the opinion goes on to discuss whether the officer had um, sufficient uh, reason to go into the panel based on just a consent search. Um, and of course, if, if you are searching on consent, then you're somewhat limited. Uh, the consent you know, only, only goes so far as to what a reasonable person would consent to. However, if, if the officer has good reason to look somewhere, like in a panel, um, as was the case with this officer, then he, he needs to have um, sufficient reasoning to get into that panel. Um, and so they have a, a long discussion in this case about um, the inquiry into reasonable suspicion and what the court should do, whether they should rely on the lower court's findings of fact and give deference to those lower court findings or whether they should do something called a de novo review where they review the facts brand new. Um, and the court decided ultimately that every reasonable suspicion or probable cause determination um, when it's appealed has to be reviewed by the court um, with a de novo review. They can't give deferential treatment to the lower court's findings. Hmm. So, and, and they say, and there's some great language in this case, which kind of makes me laugh, but um, here we have been talking about reasonable suspicion and, and what it is this whole time. And, and the U.S. Supreme Court, mind you, says, articulating precisely what reasonable suspicion and probable cause mean is not possible. So that's our jumping off point right there. You can't even articulate what the, what those two things mean. Um, they go on to say they are common sense, non-technical conceptions that deal with the factual and practical considerations of everyday life on which reasonable and prudent men, not legal technicians, act. So mm. they're trying to say that like these words are not meant to be like scientifically taken apart by legal technicians. These are standards that are that exist because this is what you know law enforcement in real life have to deal with on a daily basis um and they said because of that though uh the standards are not readily or even usefully reduced to a neat set of legal rules um and then they they go on to say that uh one case will rarely provide adequate precedent for another case and that you'll need to look at each case individually and examine the facts of each of those cases. And so that's why they ultimately arrived at every case requiring de novo review. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So Once they, again, not standardized. Yep. And they, they say, and they, it's funny, they say they can't articulate what those two things mean, but then they say, we have described reasonable suspicion simply as a particularized and objective basis for suspecting the person stopped of criminal activity. Yep. Yeah, I think you said it best uh, a couple of times in a class is we know that, you know, prior to reasonable suspicion, you know, typically, sometimes it can hit you right in the face, but, you know, you have that initial hunch that you can't articulate what it is, but you have that, like, what is going on here? And then when you get to the point mm -hmm. of, analyzing the totality of everything and now you can articulate you know what's going on here you've reached reasonable suspicion at that point mm -hmm. and that's something that's helped me out because i've been in those situations i'm sure you have too al where it's like okay something's up but i don't know what yep. like, you can't i have know. a weird feeling about this dude and then <laughs> digging in and uh, getting some roadside conversation during your traffic stop and getting a set of facts uh, their stories and everything like that, basing your analysis on all of it together, you're like, okay, I can articulate what's going on here based on training and experience. Right. So all that to say, a lot of times officers put this reasonable suspicion bar so high that they feel like, even though they're there, they feel like they're not. Right. You guys got to well, bring it, it down a little bit. Yeah, and it's not necessarily their fault either because when we do a suppression hearing in court, the defense attorney fights like the Dickens yeah. to inflate what reasonable suspicion is and to make that standard something much higher than it actually is. And then 
of course, prosecution is trying to minimize what that is. But most of the time we we try our best to be extremely ad accurate as to what it is. So they're inflating it. We're being accurate. Then the judge tends to fall somewhere in between, which oh. is in and of itself too high naturally. Right. Um, and so then you get rulings. Um, I, I can think of a, a case that we had in, in our jurisdiction where the, you know, the judge ruled that there wasn't reasonable suspicion. And I felt like the case had everything. Um, it was another prosecutor that handled the suppression hearing, but he did a good job at it. And, you know, we had weird story, weird driving behavior, like nervousness, but really there was a good comparative analysis and the passenger was extremely nervous, right? Like it had everything. And in that case, just because the defense attorney did a really good job of inflating what it was and, and the prosecutor was honest about what he felt it was, it naturally got inflated. And then the court found that there was insufficient reasonable suspicion. And so I think some officers will run into that experience and some prosecutors will run into that experience and it leaves everyone feeling like it's more than what it is. Yeah. Yep. And it's funny because it, it, <laughs> I've seen it in, in, I hate to use this word. Sometimes it's prosec prosecutor specific too. Like we've seen that, you know, a prosecutor will just be like, yeah, that's, that's not good enough. I don't like it. And then you'll take it to another prosecutor and they're like, oh, this is good. Like, I really like this. And then that falls into judges. It falls into defense attorneys. It falls into officers even, right? Supervisors. Right. You know, I've seen super, I've heard stories. I've had great supervisors my entire career, but I've heard horror stories of people writing up a report and justifying their detention with reasonable suspicion and supervisors looking at them like this isn't reasonable suspicion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these supervisors who lack the experience um, and this officer who's writing the report has far more uh, experience when it comes to this stuff, but sometimes it won't even get past the supervisor. Right. Sometimes those reports are stop right there. Like, hey, you didn't have enough. We're not, you know, instead of, I, 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 I can't say that for a fact. I don't know if they stop right there, but at least I would hope they're sending them to the, you know, attorney's office to be reviewed over them stopping. They're scrutinizing them. Yeah. Like I would hope they're sending them up and letting the DA's office or prosecutor's office, whatever you call it in your area, like make that determination. Um, so but I've heard my, horror stories. My general, that, my general rule of thumb is unless it's like, like painfully obvious the officer didn't get to reasonable suspicion and those instances are very few and far between. I will give the officer a chance to articulate why he felt he was at reasonable suspicion on the stand during the suppression hearing. I've learned that officers do a better job oftentimes of articulating their reasonable suspicion on the stand than they do in their report, which yeah. I don't know why that is. That should never be the case. Like you have the time to like sit down and think about the things that you're saying and even review body cam while you're writing your report. So if you're ever going to articulate it really well, it should be in your report writing. But I've seen it enough that I think it's a thing that officers are are better at articulating their reasonable suspicion on the stand. Um, and so I will give them a chance to do that. And if we lose at a suppression hearing, then so be it. The judge has done his or her job. And honestly, without this being a finely tuned set of legal standards like we talked about, there is always going to be this messiness that accompanies this analysis. And, and so I don't think it's my place to make that determination. I, I think I've got to always give that to the judge. I think that's the judge's job in these analysis. Um, and so I would caution any prosecutor to not be so trigger happy to dismiss a case because they feel in their infinite wisdom that there's not sufficient reasonable suspicion. Um, I'm someone who has prosecuted hundreds of these drug cases and read hundreds of reports and I've done a lot of suppression hearings and there have been numerous times where I've been surprised by the court's ruling that there was sufficient reasonable suspicion. And so because of that, I it is a very rare circumstance that I will decide up front that there's not enough and decline or dismiss the case. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Leave it up to the court to figure it out too. Yeah. And on that same note, some of our, uh, our listeners, I've talked about this before, but one of the things I've been doing recently is any motion to suppress, uh, anything that 
Well, any suppression hearing that I get it subpoenaed to, the first thing that I've been doing is is reaching out to my prosecutor's office and having them send me the actual motion. When you get to read the motion written up by a defense attorney on why your case or your evidence should be completely suppressed, it's like watching game film in a way, like when you're, you know, playing football or whatever it may be. <laughs> like I absolutely love it. And I love it. I'm addicted to motions to suppress. I want everybody, Jared, if you get some, send them over to me because I love watching this defense attorney. And it's so funny you use the word like inflate or em embellish on things. Like it's crazy. Like sometimes people think that we're stretching reasonable suspicion. They are stretching far more than we ever do when it comes to get a case dismissed on like how we are, our conduct. You know, I had a, I had a, a time where I was on the stand and I was talking about nervousness and the defense attorneys said, well, I was, I assume that you're dressed as you are now when you made contact with my client. And it was, it was just a prelim. So I wasn't dressed up, but I, w I had my outer carrier on and I said, yes. Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, of course, of course they were absolutely scared that you were going to shoot them. Look at what you're wearing. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, oh my <laughs> gosh. So it's funny that we get accused of that, you know, stretching things. At least I do by defense attorneys. Yeah. So if we're, the if we're putting reasonable suspicion in its proper place, then I think it's important to know and case law bears this out. Um, it is more than an inarticulate hunch. So we talked about the spidey sense, the tingly feeling that you get. You know something's up. It's more than that, but it's not by much. Uh, it's, an inart it's more than an inarticulate hunch. So if you can articulate why you have the hunch, then by my estimation, we're there. Um, because based on your training and experience, then it becomes particularized and an objective basis for believing criminal activity is going on. Um, and so you get the feelings initially that something's up and then you start paying attention and noticing all the things that are going on in your traffic stop. And then once you're able to say why you had those feelings, I think that's reasonable suspicion. Um, the courts have said that it is, it is, uh, far south of a preponderance of the evidence. And preponderance of the evidence is a finely tuned legal standard. It is just past 50%. So if you can tip the scale just past 50%, then you're at a preponderance of the evidence. Um, and so reasonable suspicion is south of that. And it's also south of probable cause, which probable cause has been deemed far south of a preponderance of the evidence. Um, so again, if we're putting it in its proper place, I think it's closer to that inarticulate hunch than it is to probable cause right yeah uh, but obviously clear. there's you know there's a lot of deviation and that's kind of a wide chasm between those two things and that's what leads to a lot of um, the disagreement and confusion about it but if we're trying to keep things simple and put it in its proper place i think once you're at the point where you can articulate why you have the feelings that you have then you're golden Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that uh, explanation of it too, Jared. And to everybody that's listening and everybody who's going going to listen to this podcast, why are we harping so hard on reasonable suspicion? This is an interdiction podcast, mainly. We talk about a lot of stuff, but mainly interdiction. We teach interdiction. Why do we harp so much on reasonable suspicion? Well, there's two reasons. Number one, in 2015, a case law that scared the nation came out called Rodriguez. You remember when this came out, Al? Oh yeah, I remember. Okay. So it <laughs> we were done. yeah, it terrified the it, every single cop that uh was around at this time. And what happened was Rodriguez came out and the headlines basically stated officers can no longer call for a dog on traffic stop, right? And so supervisors, admin were getting emails about, you know, cops can no longer call for a dog absent reasonable suspicion, but they didn't even read the case law and it automatically would come to people like me, which I was told Hey, we're done calling for a dog on a traffic stop. You can't use a dog anymore. Um, you can't extend a stop for them. And that's just how it is. And that's how we're going to do it. So in my brain, uh, you know, we were done. Interdiction was done. And uh, for people like Al, who had been doing interdiction for a long time, looked at this case law and said, what, what changed, right? Really? It was a good case law for us. Yeah. Honestly. It was what you guys have been doing this entire time. And why, what you guys had been doing was this. You would stop a car. During the course of your traffic stop, if reasonable suspicion was developed, you would now move this into a criminal investigation. And if that involved calling a dog, you would do that. Correct. And what was happening is there were some people out there that were conducting traffic stops. And because the driver, 
looked like a tweaker in their brain, they were calling for a dog and mm-hmm. delaying uh, the stop and waiting mm-hmm. for this dog to show up with no real reasonable suspicion. And so when it came out, it was obvious. It's like, well, I, and if you actually read the case, I shouldn't say it was obvious. It was, everybody made it not obvious saying that it was the worst case law ever. But when you actually read it, it was, if you were going to detain somebody longer than the, uh, it took you for the mission of the stop, you better have reasonable suspicion. Well, yeah, welcome to the fourth amendment, right? Right. Like right. that makes total sense. I totally agree with this case law that if we are going to keep them longer than it took us to do the mission of the stop for a dog in this case, yes, you probably should have a reason to hold them. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's why we harp on reasonable suspicion because in interdiction, if you are going to wait for a dog to come, you better have reasonable suspicion. The other reason that we want you to understand reasonable suspicion is if you're conducting traffic stops and you want to search this car at some point, whether ask for consent or call for a dog, and you don't have reasonable suspicion, the question is then why? Why, why are we doing that? We want you to develop reasonable suspicion and then look into that. We shouldn't be wanting to search cars when we haven't developed at reasonable suspicion whatsoever. Yeah, that's just a toss of the dice. Exactly. You're just wasting people's time. Yep. And so that's a big reason, you know, we bring Jared on to instruct with us and our two-day class is built on roadside conversation, do a quick analysis of the totality of everything that you've observed. Do you or do you not have reasonable suspicion? If not, let them go. Go stop another car. If you do, let's figure out what's going on here. Right. So I think that's why we harp on reasonable suspicion so much is those two reasons. And then I guess a third would be, I don't think that we properly understood it when we graduated the academy. And it does take a lot more than, you know, the 18 week or 20 week academy that you went through your FTO. And it takes some learning more. It takes a little bit of learning. Yes, it does. To be confident. It's like the case law to be a confident officer and to be able to make confident decisions and move forward with your investigations or decide if you have enough, you have to be confident. You have to understand where these came from, not just an understanding that my FTO said it was okay. Yeah. Um, and that's what a lot of people, especially <laughs> I did early on, you operate yeah. on this. Well, I was taught this. You, you got to know why mm-hmm. yep. you got to be confident. You do. Yeah. It was and, funny. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jared. Um, I was just going to say, and it is normal. Again, we, we've talked about how complex the analysis is, and, and it's normal to have some uncomfortability with it. And and I've got to say, there are prosecutors that, that I've worked with that have naturally inflated what reasonable suspicion was. And after a lot of like office meetings and long conversations and one-on-ones, I, I think I'm getting most of my coworkers at least to come around to seeing reasonable suspicion the way I do. Um, and I, I even have a judge now that I, I feel like I'm kind of slowly but surely starting to sway him that it's not this this crazy hurdle that, you know, defense counsel wants to make it out to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you have judges and prosecutors misinterpreting it, then, yeah, it, it, it can make it very difficult for an officer to have confidence in it. But again, we've talked about trying to, to simplify this. And another way of thinking about it is if you as an officer, from your point of view, with your experience and your training, feel that some crime is occurring um, and you can articulate why you feel that, then it's it's reasonable suspicion. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And on that note, I've read this before on a uh, past episode, but this goes so well with what we're talking about. And I wanted to read it again um, about you know how you're talking about how even prosecutors naturally inflate the reasonable suspicion. And I think this will make a lot of officers happy. It made me happy when I read it, but this is USB Santos. This is out of the 10th circuit, but I think it's pretty universal. It says, we bear in mind that the officer and not the court was present at the encounter. And the officer and not the court has the training and experience to evaluate and compare the reactions of the motorists to questioning. We therefore give the officer's assessment the due weight to which it is entitled under the Supreme Court's precedence. So I absolutely I love, love that. that. Yes. Yeah. I think oftentimes, like you were saying, naturally, you know, these guys are looking at like, I don't really think that's suspicious, but they're not the ones that have made the hundreds and hundreds of traffic stops over the last 10 years or right. over 
thousands over the last 30 years where we have seen time and time again the innocent motoring public and those who are involved in criminal activity. What's up, everybody? I want to take just a second here and remind all LEOs who are listening to this podcast to get signed up for the LEO Network. Owned and operated by a full-time LEO, this platform is built for you. Discounts in police gear, largest LEO training calendar available, course recommendations, and a lot more. Training companies, LEO Network handles all the certificates for your attendees and has some of the best features coming out that will make your job a million times easier. Check them out at leonetwork.com. So I wanted to talk about a case that I had and just kind of read the DR to you. Um, we talked earlier about, you know, some things I like to see and some things I don't like to see um, in the report writing side of it. Um, and, and I think this is pretty instructive. So I'll, I'll just read the report. It, it's it's really short. Um, and I won't, obviously, I won't say who the officer was that wrote it. Um, but uh, it says on October 16, 2015, at about 3.52 uh, a.m., I conducted a traffic stop on US 60 about mile post 304 with a black Isuzu SUV. Um, they were traveling 50 in a 45. Um, I can I contacted the driver, Carol Lincourt, who identified herself with a valid Arizona driver's license. I noticed Carol appeared to be sweating. Her hands were shaky. I asked Carol to step out of the vehicle. While I wrote out a warning, um, I asked Carol if there were any weapons on her or in the vehicle. Carol stated no. While back at my vehicle, Carol stated she was coming from Phoenix, heading to Sholo for this week for the weekend. I noticed Carol looking at her vehicle several different times. Carol kept rolling up her sleeves and trying to control the conversation. Carol kept putting her hand on top of her head, playing with her hair. I asked Carol again about having any guns, large amounts of money, or drugs in the vehicle. Carol stated no to all the questions. I asked Carol for consent to search the vehicle due to her nervous behavior. Carol stated no. I then conducted a free air sniff of the vehicle. Um, and I'll stop there. I actually won't read the whole report because it's at this point now that we, we've got to ask the question, do we have sufficient reasonable suspicion to prolong the detention time in order to call for the canine? Um, and I guess I'll ask you, Bauer and Al, what do you guys think? Is there enough there? Uh, it, it's hard for me to, I, I'm kind of like you, Jared. I want to give this officer a chance to articulate a little bit more outside of the report. Um, I would prefer if I was a prosecutor to see a little bit more in the report. Uh, and I would like to give this officer a chance to articulate this stuff on the stand. Um, but I would r throw it back on you, Jared, and say, how, how on earth do you write a response if that was a, if that was a motion? To suppress how would you write a response back for it you know what i mean not to go to emotion based on that um i think that'd be pretty hard to do um based on those circumstances i we would hope that you would get a little bit more uh personally what do you think Al? i don't love it i mean uh i feel like it's got holes and gaps um obviously there's maybe he didn't articulate everything that was going on there and I like the uh, fact that Jared's always willing to put them on the stand and let them explain. And But I feel like uh, could have done a little bit better job of articulation in the report because right now, with what you've said, and I hate to be this way, I hate to be the oddball out, but I, I just don't feel like we're there. Like, uh, there's some things that are missing. Well, you know, there's holes everywhere. We talk about in our, our class, the science, if you will, or the process of obtaining reasonable suspicion and that's done through roadside conversation and in this particular case i'm missing where this officer is having that conversation at all you yeah, know he he, had, he he mentioned or she or whoever it was mentioned they were coming from phoenix to show up for the weekend what for yeah who are you going to see how long are you going to be there yeah there's like they you said know, there's like, big holes and there's craters in this yeah, and then you can you can go off of those a little bit too. I mean, obviously yeah. you, you got to diligently pursue the mission of the stop and be a little right. bit careful of extending it. But I think there's a little bit more that could be done as far as roadside. Yeah, but I think if and I'm, my own opinion here, but if this officer uh, observed uh, nervousness and sweating, um, clearly there's there's uh, a reason for this, and it doesn't even try to like is this person sick do they need medical attention i mean they i don't feel like at least in the report that was read they are even are, tried to articulate anything there yeah. and then uh like you said the trip 
that's a that's a that's an easy one to dive into um i don't know so i, I love i love here. your discussion about it i this was one that i got where you know it, it's not in my nature to just give up on a case and so I, I i was talking to the drug task force and this officer and i was like i i need more to go off of than what's in the report um and to the officer's credit he did a he did a fantastic job of a roadside interview he had her talking about how it was such a horrible time to be driving that early in the morning because there were so many elk out on the roadway and note it, it's october um it, when this traffic stop occurred at you know early morning hours in sholo it's freezing cold outside and she's sweating um the playing with the hair wasn't it happened a lot more than he he talked about like to the point where it was almost kind of like cringy the amount of time she's like touching her head and playing with her hair during the traffic encounter and the amount of time she looks back at the vehicle during the traffic encounter while he's asking her like his basic questions you got any like guns drugs bombs things like that bodies inside your vehicle um but also uh in asking about there being more stuff my drug task force finally decided to tell me that they had a tracker on the vehicle oh. um, that Carol Lincourt was a known drug dealer. They had applied for and obtained a warrant to put a tracker on her vehicle. And they tried to do an interagency wall off stop, which I guess I wanted to talk about this case so that I could say this, don't, don't do this. If all of this is happening within your own agency, don't do a wall or a whisper stop. Um, provide the prosecutor with all of the ammunition that you have. If a, an informant merely points the finger of suspicion towards the defendant, then you can protect their identity. You don't have to disclose them, you know, as long as they're not a, a material witness to the case. Um, and, and that's what happened in this case. They wanted to do a wall off because they wanted to protect their informant who allowed them to obtain the tracking warrant. Um, and so it was kind of misguided right from the start, but if you have probable cause to get a, a tracker on the vehicle, then reasonable suspicion on her way back from being down in the valley for some time is kind of a foregone conclusion. Um, and then you add to that the officer's ability to articulate absolutely everything that he was noticing. And he did a fantastic job on the stand during the suppression hearing. Um, we we were at reasonable suspicion for for days and days and days, even though the report is is pretty much bare minimum and I, and I think what happened here was the officer got nervous about including certain details in the report mm -hmm. because he didn't want to mess up this this whisper stop investigation that he had been asked to become part of um mm -hmm. i understand okay. why the feds will do it you know you got to protect the wire and and how you 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 know you get up on the wire and those cost so much money to conduct wire investigations that you know, if if you have somebody coming through a county with a lot of drugs, you'll you'll do whisper stops, and you want the officer to develop everything on their own to stop the vehicle. Um, and in that situation, that makes sense. But if it's if it's all within your same local agency, then this should be a practice that like you never ever engage in. Mm. Interesting. It is, but I'm glad that you. <laughs> Again, like you said earlier, I'm glad that you gave this officer the opportunity to, to articulate a little bit more on the stand because it sounds like in this case, he did a way better job. I I, I got to say this. I, I hate even critiquing in the slightest because that was me. Like that was me and it took a long time to get to. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm the best by any means now, but from where I am today, where I was back then is a world of difference. And I wrote reports like that. I mean... I did. And we've all evolved though. It did. And what taught yeah. me the most, I mean, you have, you know, what taught me the most was court itself, uh, mm -hmm. testifying itself, reading the suppressions and going to suppression hearings and finding out, oh, yeah, I probably should have done that different. Right. Um, so uh, that's another reason court's good. You know, it gets the. And uh, th this case experience. was a fun one because we did the, we did the Rodriguez hearing um, on that suppression motion. And then they also challenged the traffic stop, the going 50 and a 45. They didn't like that, um, but everything, all of the officer's conduct was upheld. We ended up going to trial on it, and um, she she took the stand for whatever reason. And so all of that evidence about her choosing this odd time to be driving early in the morning with elk all around like ended up being 
pivotal evidence that she was trying to avoid law enforcement. And that's why at her own peril, she chose to drive at the time that she did. Um, and so all of those good facts that the officer got from the roadside investigation led to a conviction. You know, the jury was able to hang their hat on a lot of those details to prove that she was knowingly transporting. Um, and so this is a good example of what like on its face might appear to be kind of a stinker of a report. Um, wasn't uh, ultimately ended up being a phenomenal case because, you know, none of us were willing to give up on it and we fought to keep it alive. And, and then we were able to get the conviction in the end. Wow. Nice. Love it. Perfect example of making, you know, the court decide if you would have just mm -hmm. thrown this out based on that report. I mean, yep. you know, big time mistake and big time loss there. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing with that with us, Jared. We're running on uh, close to an hour and a half now. So we'll wrap this up. We appreciate all you guys listening uh, to our podcast. Keep an eye out for more of our episodes coming. We've got some really cool guests that we're working on. We're look we're working on some interdictors out of Australia. Uh, interdictors out of Canada. So we've got some uh, really cool perspectives coming down the road on, you know, interdiction in different parts of the world, not just nation. So awesome. keep an eye out for those episodes. Uh, Jared, let's do this again because I think that this podcast has been one of the most beneficial for our listeners uh, in understanding reasonable suspicion. So we're going to do this again and, and cover a few more topics. Um, yeah, anytime. And thank you for having me. 